So I have a bit of a confession to make. I've never actually played any of the Metal Gear Solid games. I always meant to, and at one point I did. I picked up Metal Gear Solid 4 and I remember not liking it at all. Now there's something to be said about picking up the fourth game in a franchise and expecting to know what the heck is going on, but even at this time I remember seeing snippets of all the other games and being like, what is this? Why are so many people infatuated with it? I wanted to be able to understand where people are coming from whenever they talk about this series of games or whenever they talked about Kojima products as a whole. And I felt that there was no better time in my life than now when I have a series dedicated to looking back at the games of our past to go back and give Metal Gear Solid a fair chance to capture my heart like it has so many others. Now again, I want to reiterate that I have never played a Kojima game more than about an hour. I never really got it per se. The story, the gameplay, there were so many little things that just didn't click with me. And I would say that over the years I've developed a sort of confirmation bias. I would look at all the things I didn't like and say, this is why I don't like Kojima games and they aren't for me. But that's not really fair. I never gave them the chance that they need. I say all this because I honestly went into this game wanting to hate Metal Gear Solid and then come back with a video saying this is why this series sucks and this is why Kojima's not as good as everyone praises him to be. But that's not right. It's not fair to Kojima and it's not fair to his games. If I wanted to go about my life not liking his products, then I should at least give them a chance so I can form my own concrete opinions. So on today's episode, I will be playing my very first Metal Gear Solid game from beginning to end. Sit back, relax, Grab your favorite snack or drink and join me as I finally play Metal Gear Solid. Metal Gear Solid takes place six years after the events of Metal Gear 2. Don't worry, you don't have to have played Metal Gear 2 in order to understand what's going on in Metal Gear Solid. In fact, the game provides you with a nice text-based recap of what's happening in both Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2. But the only thing that you really need to know is that in Metal Gear 2, Solid Snake was sent to infiltrate a place called Zanzibar Land, and while there, on Zanzibar Land, he fought and killed a man named Grey Fox and burned to death a character named Big Boss. Other than that, Metal Gear Solid is a completely independent story. As is laid out once you boot up the game, Solid Snake is called out of retirement by Roy Campbell, his former commander from his time as a member of a high-tech special forces unit, Foxhound. Colonel Campbell tells Snake that there is a terrorist group that has taken over a nuclear disposal site in Alaska called Shadow Moses. This terrorist group that has taken over Shadow Moses is none other than Foxhound. You see, Foxhound is made up of six members. Psycho Mattis, with his powerful psychic abilities. Sniper Wolf, a beautiful and deadly sharpshooter. Decoy Octopus, master of disguise. Vulcan Raven. Giant and Shaman, and Revolver Ocelot, specialist in interrogation and a formidable gunfighter. Looks like a lovely bunch of folks. And finally, in charge of them, Foxhound squad leader, Liquid Snake. These terrorists have threatened to launch the nukes on the Shadow Moses site if they do not receive the remains of Big Boss within 24 hours. Snake's mission, if he chooses to accept, is as follows. First, he is to infiltrate Shadow Moses and find and rescue the DARPA chief Donald Anderson and the arms tech president Kenneth Baker. They hold the only two codes for launching the nukes on Shadow Moses, and if the terrorists get the codes from them, it's game over. Snake's second mission is to find out if the terrorists actually have the capacity to access the nukes. The odds seem stacked against Snake, as the terrorists hold all the chips and they have way more members than he. But Snake won't have to tackle this mission alone. He has access to a slew of different companions that will help him every step of the way. And when I say every step, I do mean every three steps. Snake's companions throughout the games are as follows. Roy Campbell as the acting commander of this mission, Naomi Hunter, the Foxhound medical chief, Mei Ling, the one who developed the Kodak and Soliton radar, Natasha Romanenko, a weapons expert who I didn't talk to once throughout my playthrough and Master Miller, Snake's former mentor. As Snake infiltrates the Shadow Moses compound, he finds that everything isn't how it seems. From mysterious deaths, 
enemies that always seem to be one step ahead, and comrades that aren't telling the whole truth. It's up to Snake and his arsenal of skills to uncover the truth and stop it all. As the player, the initial story of MGS1 was so captivating and equally mind-bending. Around every corner and during every 20-minute cutscene, Snake learns about a new piece of information that throws him and the player for a loop. Now, I'll make no illusions that I'm the type of person that can play through a game only to come back and tell you all the larger narratives that the game has set up, or even the microplots that are intertwined. I'm not that kind of guy. Hell, I can barely even remember what I did yesterday, let alone decipher the inner workings of Kojima, but I'll try to do a quick rundown of some of the events that take place. After Snake infiltrates the Shadow Moses compound, he quickly makes his way to meet up with the DARPA chief Donald Anderson and the arms tech president Kenneth Baker, who both tell Snake what they have figured out of the terrorist plan, and what Snake should be able to do about it. Both of their stories are similar, yet somewhat conflicting, which isn't something that you immediately notice upon your first playthrough. Or at least I didn't, I'm not sure about you. Anything that I might have caught, I had chalked up to translation errors or honest to god bad writing. So anyways, back to the story. Donald Anderson and Kenneth Baker tell Snake of the terrorist plan to use the nukes stored on Shadow Moses and their ways of launching them by use of the prototype mech called Metal Gear Rex, which was secretly being developed here on the base. When the DARPA chief tells Snake his side of the tale, he tells him that there's only one way to stop the attack, and that's to deactivate the nukes by use of the three PAL keycards that our dear friend Kenneth Baker has. Unfortunately, before Snake is able to get any more information from the DARPA chief, he suddenly dies of a heart attack. Left with one of his targets that he was supposed to save dead, Snake goes off to find his secondary target, Kenneth Baker. He is being held in the basement by one of the Foxhound members, Revolver Ocelot, but Snake is able to defeat him with a lot of help from a cyborg ninja who we're not sure if is friend or foe. When we finally talk to Kenneth Baker, he tells us that he actually doesn't have the PAL keycard anymore. He has given it to his old cellmate Merrill. Merrill, for those of you who aren't aware, is Colonel Campbell's niece, and the reason why he has sent Snake, one of his most trusted allies and friends, on this mission. It seems that Merrill was originally stationed on this base, and when Foxhound took over, she rebelled against them and was thrown in jail against her will. Kenneth Baker tells Snake that he has to find Merrill in order to get the PAL keycards, the only way to deactivate the nukes from launching. Just in case though, Kenneth Baker does tell Snake of a secondary way to stop the whole attack. He would have to find Hal Emmerich, the lead engineer on the Metal Gear series, and cooperate with Hal in order to destroy Metal Gear before it's able to launch any of the nukes. Again, very similar to the DARPA chief, the arms tech president dies of a mysterious heart attack before Snake is able to get him to safety. Everyone that Snake is in contact with plays like they are confused by the turn of events, but Snake knows that he is being kept in the dark by somebody. He doesn't know who, but someone isn't telling the whole truth. Realizing that he's not going to uncover the mystery right now, Snake continues on in his mission. From here out, this mission that Snake is on gets no easier. He is forced to run throughout the Shadow Moses compound, sneaking past a plethora of guards patrolling his path, meeting allies that seem to have their own agendas, and fighting against the deadly members of Foxhound, all the while uncovering the ever-increasing amount of mysteries that are laid out before him. In the end, Snake is able to triumph over all the perils and completes his mission. For the most part, the story is pretty solid. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. I always knew the story of Metal Gear Solid was this unapproachable, twisted, filled mess that was off the wall and full of flair and grandiose cutscenes that go on for too long, but Metal Gear Solid 1 was much more restrained than I was expecting. The whole thing seems like a fairly self-contained story, and almost all of the information I needed was provided upon me playing. Sure, there were twists that seemed to come out of nowhere, the cutscenes were far too long and filled with some fluff. But upon my second playthrough, I realized that everything was laid out right before my eyes and half the time said outright to Snake's face. The beauty of the game is that it only gets better upon repeat playthroughs. When you know what the twists are, you start to realize the reason certain people act in specific ways is because they are hiding something from Snake or trying to advance their own goals. For its time, and I dare say even by today's standards, Metal Gear Solid 1 did a great job telling an interconnected story with a cinematic feel. You can really feel the love and care that was put into this story. Part of this has to do with the cutscenes. 
they have a level of cinematography that has never really been seen on the PS1 days. There were decent levels of voice acting performance given by most characters, and even the animations were used well to give convincing character acting, but that all really comes with the original version of Metal Gear Solid. When talking about the remake, Twin Snakes, I found that I was way less interested in what was happening during the cutscenes. Granted, most everything was kept the same as far as the story goes, but all the voice cast came back to reprise their roles and re-record their lines, and there are obvious differences in their performance. I'm probably going to get some flack for this hot take, but I do not like David Hayter's voice in Twin Snakes. He tries way too hard to force out the snake voice, and it makes it painfully obvious that it's voice acted. No one actually talks like that. A voice actor's role is to make the characters come alive and believable, but I found David Hayter's voice took me right out of the story. Speaking of the differences between Twin Snakes and the classic PS1 version, I think we can all agree that the reworked cutscenes were completely unnecessary. For some reason, Kojima pulled a George Lucas and added extra bits of the cutscenes that are questionable at best. Most of the characters have borderline superhuman acrobatics and sometimes act in ways that contrast the more serious tone of the story. Whereas, I felt the original cut of Metal Gear Solid was more of a dark spy espionage type game where Twin Snakes seems more like Kojima had just seen the Matrix movies for the first time and wanted everyone to do flips and slow motions to make it seem more epic. It actually does the complete opposite in my mind and does nothing but make the whole thing seem more goofy in comparison especially when he overuses the car screeching or airplane sound effects. My god, that got annoying. Now, it doesn't ruin the whole experience, and I did find that I enjoyed my time with Twin Snakes quite a lot. But if I had the choice, I wish I could have the gameplay of Twin Snakes, but keep the cutscenes of the original game, as I found the story kept me hooked from beginning to end. But I guess that leads us perfectly into the next section, where we can talk about the gameplay of Metal Gear Solid and the Twin Snakes. Metal Gear Solid 1 is an isometric stealth game, and more aptly put, a tactical espionage game. The main focus is around stealth and sneaking around enemy traps and patrols, but Snake isn't just a one-trick pony relying on stealth alone. Oftentimes his missions will force him to use weapons and tools to advance on throughout the dangers. Snake has an absolutely stacked arsenal of weapons and tools to use throughout his time on Shadow Moses. From silent SOCOM pistols, chaff grenades to remote-controlled Nikita missiles, from food rations, mine detectors, and cardboard boxes. Snake will eventually pick up everything he needs, and more, to complete his mission. Now, I will admit, the game is not that friendly towards new players. There is quite the learning curve in Metal Gear that I personally was not ready for. My first time playing through the game, I spent close to an hour on the cargo docks and helicopter landing pad. I just couldn't wrap my head around all these mechanics the game was throwing at me. On top of everything else, add on the absolutely minuscule health bar, and the margin for errors is almost zero. Most games introduce players to the concepts and mechanics of their games slowly with a large margin of error so that when they bring in new mechanics one by one, it doesn't overwhelm the player. But Metal Gear Solid 1 doesn't do any of this. Right from the get-go, you are placed in the cargo docks where you have to avoid two patrolling guards and you have to reach the elevator on the other side of the room. Seems simple enough, right? Wrong. As a first-time player, not only do you have to get used to the controls, but also the sneaking mechanics and the enemy AI all at once. What do the guards do? Okay, they patrol on a fixed route. What can they see? Well, it seems like they can only see what's within their vision cone on the radar. What can they hear? Seemingly nothing, since I can run up right behind them and they won't notice. And finally, how do they react to being alerted? From what I can tell, they will investigate a disturbance before going into an alerted state. Once alerted, they will chase Snake, but can lose track of him easily and go back to their normal patrols. Already, this is quite a lot to throw at a new player, but with some time, it shouldn't be that difficult to learn. But, the game really throws a wrench into that. For some reason, the cargo docks is the only place in the game to throw in these water puddles, right in the obvious path to go down. 
If Snake steps on these puddles, it will alert the guards, and they will go to investigate. Nowhere else in the game do these puddles appear, and to put those kinds of obstacles in the face of a new player was a recipe for me dying over and over again. There is a similar type of mentality throughout the entire game that made my first playthrough an absolute nightmare. I must have died well over a hundred times throughout my first playthrough, most of them not even really my fault. Like the random pitfalls scattered throughout the game or the claymores placed seemingly at random. It would be one thing if the floor was a different color to mark the trap doors or the claymores were placed in well defined sections, but to put them in these random corners of a room where I had no indication they were there, it's just kind of rude. And that's just one of the examples, but simple stuff like that made me want to just kill myself and start the mission over with fresh supplies, then deal with the hassle that was introduced. To add on to this frustration though, Metal Gear Solid in its original version has a limited amount of supplies for Snake to collect. So it is entirely possible to run out of things like ammo, rations, and whatever because you were experimenting with ways to pass certain dangers or to see if they were even there in the first place. There are multiple sections in this game that I can recall where I could have locked myself out from completing the game. Thankfully I never did. One instance I can recall is climbing the stairs to the communication tower. You ascend four flights of stairs, and out of nowhere, there's a gun turret. And because of the isometric view and the jammed radar, you have no warning that the turret is there. So you think, okay, fine, it's one turret, it's not that bad, I can afford the health hit. But unbeknownst to you, there are three more sets of turrets along the stairs, and each new set increases the amount of turret shooting at you. So no matter what, if you just try to run past, you are going to die. When I first encountered this, I thought one turret was going to be it, and the end of the mission would be right around the corner. Losing a bit of health wasn't that terrible, but, you know, I would have to remember that if I ever return to this area, that there are turrets there. But to my dismay, the stairways just keep on going, and every so often more turrets would shoot at me. At the time, I didn't realize that there was a pattern for the way the turrets would show up every fourth floor. I had no way of knowing how long I would be on the stairs for, so I resorted to throwing chaff grenades every second floor. I eventually got to the top, did my business up there, and had to go back down the stairs, again throwing away all my chaff grenades. I was lucky that I even had enough chaff grenades to make this trip possible. I can imagine some poor soul running around trying to experiment with the game mechanics earlier on, and when they reached this point, they found they didn't have enough chaff grenades to even make it past this part of the game. Who knows how far back they would have to go in order to have enough chaff grenades. Now, I will say that when you get to the rhythm of the game, the trial and error mentality isn't as bad, and it does boast some interesting gameplay. There are so many interesting set pieces and unique challenges around every corner. I will say that the game shines the brightest upon your second playthrough, when you know what tools to use properly and how to avoid the guards and not dying at random. I have no proof to this claim, and I don't stand by it 100%. But Metal Gear Solid might be best enjoyed when played by someone who knows everything about the game while being watched by another, kind of like a movie. In a way, the Twin Snakes version of the game is a step forward, and equally a step backwards at the same time. Twin Snakes came out after Metal Gear 2 Solid was popular, and went back to update the original game so that it fit more in line with the series going forward. Some of the changes including a walk and a run for Snake, the walk would make Snake's movement slower and eliminate all noise, while the run was obviously quick, yet loud. Snake could also hang off the sides of walls and ledges, a trick I never really used, but the biggest and best, yet worst change to the game was implementing first-person aiming, a feature the PS1 version did not have. To me, it made the game feel a lot easier. As Snake, you were no longer relying on the game's janky auto-aim controls to take out enemies. I could freely use the weapons as I felt comfortable, but this does come with a drawback. Metal Gear 1 was not meant to be played with first person aiming, and it does ruin the game a tad since it wasn't made with that in mind. The levels aren't retooled, enemy placements aren't changed, cameras are a non-threat since Snake can just shoot them out now, patrolling guards are no longer an issue as I can just take them out with a tranquilizer. Oh yeah, did I mention that they added a tranquilizer gun? Early on in Twin Snakes, Snake gets access to a silence pistol that can knock enemies out unconscious. It is far and wide the best way to play the game, as most other weapons will alert other guards, and, well, it's just kind of fun. 
Again, the game was not originally meant to be played with a Trank gun, but to make up for this, Twin Snake's guards can spot Snake from much further away and will also wake each other up if they see one of their comrades sleeping. There are other parts in the game that completely break because of the first person aiming, but I found it to be much more enjoyable because I wasn't dying all the time. For example, the Ocelot boss fight. In the original, you had to chase Ocelot, pop off a few shots here and there, but in the remake, you can kind of just stand in one spot, go into first person aiming, and shoot Ocelot in the head, and bing bong boom, he's dead. Or the Psycho Mantis fight. It really becomes a cakewalk when you can track his movements in first person view. You can lay on the floor, shoot him while on the floor, which you couldn't do in the original. I'm sure for some people it really does ruin the whole experience, but to me, as someone who hasn't played the rest of the Metal Gear games, it makes me excited to go on to Metal Gear Solid 2, since that's where all of these mechanics originated. Other than that, I don't have too much else to say on Metal Gear Solid 1 in the Twin Snakes remake. Despite the few complaints I've had here or there, I found that I enjoyed my time with these games much more than I had originally thought I would. I'm a little disappointed knowing that from here Metal Gear series is going to get wackier and more off the wall than I'm comfortable with, as evidenced by Twin Snakes, but I'm going to have to try to leave my bias at the door when I try to look at these games in an objective manner. I was prepared to hate this game, and part of me wanted to hate this game. I didn't want to admit to myself that most of my reasons for not liking Metal Gear were unfounded and factually incorrect. That if I had actually given the game a time of day, I would have realized what it was I was missing. I am now more excited than ever to go on through the next game in the franchise and see if all my misgivings or praise will carry on, or if they'll change with time. Before I end this video, I just want to take the time out to say thank you to everyone who has followed me in my new endeavor. Starting something new that you've put your heart into is always scary. Will people like it? Will they not? Will I succeed? Will I fail? It's always a question that's lingering on my mind, so I always want to make these videos the best that they can at the point of my abilities at the moment. So if you guys have any suggestions on ways to make these videos better, then feel free to leave a comment in the section below or follow me on Twitter and let me know what's up there. Speaking of Twitter, feel free to follow me on my social media links found in the description of this video below. As always, I want to thank every one of you for joining me on today's adventure. I can't wait to jump into more games. I don't know exactly what I'm going to play next. I believe it's going to be Metal Gear Solid 2, but we may jump into another franchise and kind of balance that act out. Who knows? We'll see where the future takes us and where my mind wants to wander to next. As always, thank you so much. I'll see you next time. Peace out, and much love to you.